welcome everyone. As was indicated, um, we are going to be talking a little bit about Islandora as an IR as it stands right now. And that's not the right key to advance. There we go. Um, so who are we? My name is Seth Shaw. I'm an application developer for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I've been doing uh, this position for the last three years. And I am also an Islandora 8 committer. Um, but first, we're going to have uh, Brian introduce himself and start us off a little bit of history before I jump back in. So go ahead, Brian. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, I'm Brian Brown. I'm a repository developer at Florida State University, where I've been working for um, just completed six complete years. Um, I am one of the co-conveners for the IR interest group along with Don Richards and my email is bjbrown at fsu.edu in case you ever have any uh, burning questions you want to ask me. So um, a lot of times when you're trying to figure out where you're going it helps to know where you've been and where you're starting from and in my experience when you ask people um, what the feature set of an institutional repository is, they most often respond with the feature set of whatever the last IR that they used had. Um, for most of the people in the Islandora community, that last IR that they used is could even be the one that they're still using, um, which is an Islandora 7 institutional repository. So we're going to cover a little bit of what Islandora 7 institutional repositories look like to give us kind of a, a, a setting to figure out how we move forward with Islandora 8. Um, so since Islandora is kind of a, a grab bag of all sorts of different goodies that you can plug together to build whatever kind of system that you want, uh, we'll be covering some of the different modules that people used in Islandora 7. Uh, the first of which is the PDF solution pack, which is probably, it's, it would allow you to store, for instance, ETDs and journal articles that are PDFs in an Islandora 7 instance. Um, it's kind of like the minimum IR that you could have. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of extra features, but it's definitely a start. And there are certainly some people here in Florida who are running IRs with just the PDF solution pack storing a bunch of ETDs. And if that's all you need, uh, that's fine. But uh, there are other modules that can give you a little bit more power for your IR, one of which is Islandora usage stats, which stores um, views on objects and records, um, search queries that people submit, stores it all in the database. Every time someone looks at something, it increments a number in the database. Um, there's the entity solution pack, uh, which is sometimes kind of hard to describe because we think of Islandora as, you know, a digital asset management system, but entities often aren't necessarily storing digital assets that we need to preserve. They're more metadata oriented um, things that you use to tie different objects together. Um, if any of you have some metadata skills, you might think of these as authority records, such as people, places, events, and organizations. Um, the, probably one of the most popular IR modules is Islandora Scholar, which was created from um, University of Prince Edward Island's Island Scholar uh, Islandora repository. Um, they had a lot of custom development and they wanted to extract a lot of those custom features into one module that would allow other Islandora 7 users to have access to those same features. Um, some of those features include citation and thesis content models, um, being able to display formatted citations in any citation style via CitePROC, um, having Google Scholar meta tags display and citation and thesis displays so that Google Scholar knows what it's looking at and can index it better. The ability to do uh, complete embargoes to objects or just data streams on objects, which uh, this module is a real workhorse for a lot of IR administrators who might want to have the metadata for an ETD, for instance, uh, visible so that you can find it in a search, but just block um, access to downloading the PDF that's attached. Um, DOI imports uh, is one of the things Scholar can do. You plug in a DOI and it uses um, DOI APIs to go out and get all the metadata and create a fresh brand new shiny Islandora object for you. 
Uh, and last but not least, uh, it can do bibliographic metadata exports. Using the bookmarks module, you can kind of create collections of your favorite Islandora objects and then export that list of objects in a variety of metadata formats. Um, there's also the IP embargoes module, which uh, is kind of a, a hidden gem in the Islandora 7 collection of modules. It's created by Discovery Garden, and it allows you to create a named IP range and then restrict access to just that IP range for certain objects. And if you're trying to access that object from outside of that IP range, it can either give you a 403 access denied page or it can bounce you to a custom page where you can do fancy things like redirect someone to um, easy proxy so that they can access that object from, make it look like they're accessing it from on campus. Um, later on in Islandora 7's uh, life cycle, we saw the laser project. And if you want to know more about the laser project, Sarah Lippincott from Born Digital is giving a presentation on uh, laser later today. But it was a project out of the Islandora Collaboration Group, which is a consortium of liberal arts colleges who um, had a, a lot of people using BPress Digital Commons uh, for their institutional repositories. And when Elsevier bought BPress Digital Commons, there was a big wave in the community of people wanting to get off BPress and move towards an open source IR solution. Um, a lot of the people in the Islandora collaboration group thought, you know, why not use Islandora? We're, we already have Islandora instances, let's extend it so that we can use it for new things. Um, but they determined that compared to BPress Digital Commons, um, Islandora was a bit too much of a box of Legos with which you can build your own system. And what they really wanted was an out of the box solution. Um, so the laser project was identifying the gap between that box of Legos and an out of the box solution and trying to fill that gap with uh, new development and documentation and things like that. Um, the result of that project was improvements to Islandora Scholar, um, improvements to the use of author entities, um, new export functionality, the ability to use Matomo as a separate server for recording usage stats with client-side JavaScript instead of the standard Islandora usage stats module, um, an example self-deposit workflow, and enhancements to Islandora Scholar's documentation to let uh, newbies know how they can set up an Islandora 7 complete IR from scratch. Uh, next slide. So uh, looking forward to Islandora 8, uh, a while ago, I think back around 2016, whenever uh, it was still called CLAW, uh, there was a document called the CLAW MVP or Minimum Viable Product, or Minimum Viable Product or Project, can't remember. Um, but anyway, it was outlining what features uh, Islandora 8 would need to support in a version 1.0 to be considered a success. And the IR interest group thought, hey, that's an interesting idea. And we have kind of a similar use case. We want to know um, what features would Islandora 8 have to support in order for Islandora 7 IR users to be ready to migrate from 7 to 8. Um, so after a bit of brainstorming and feedback sessions and things like that, uh, we came up with a list of must-have features for Islandora 8 in order for Islandora 7 users to want to migrate. Um, at the top of that list is support for PDF, compound, and binary objects, uh, the ability to support embargoes and analytics tracking, preferably with client-side JavaScript, um, the ability to have customizable submission workflows, um, support for search engine optimization and uh, especially the extra stuff that Google Scholar needs in order to get your IR content into Google Scholar and highly ranked. The ability to import objects via DOIs or PubMed IDs, uh, etc. And support for uh, migration utilities that would allow Islandora 7 IR users to move all of their scholarly content from 7 to 8. Uh, next slide. So uh, you can see here that I've color coded things in terms of where we're at with them currently. If it's in green, that means that Drupal 8 already does this out of the box. Um, whenever we created that uh, MVP document, 
a lot of us didn't really understand what Drupal 8 could do out of the box. So a lot of those required features were things that were just core Drupal by the time you get to 8. Um, so a lot of, as you can see, a lot of that stuff was already ready for us. Um, the bits in yellow represent um, custom development that the Islandora 8 developers have uh, added to the Islandora modules. Um, specifically here we have compound objects and a lot of work has gone into um, having the fields say, you know, this is a member of that so that you can have multiple objects represented hierarchically. And the objects or the, the items in the list that are in red are things that aren't quite done yet or that we're still working on. Um, we see here embargoes, which I'll be talking about a little bit later in the presentation, along with um, object importing via DOIs and PubMed IDs, which to be honest is less important than a lot of the other things. It's one of the more nice to haves. Um, and at the end of the list, we have migration utilities, but I have an asterisk there because Islandora 8 actually already does have some fantastic migration utilities, uh, but those migration utilities don't have support for embargoes yet. And that is because embargoes aren't done. So you can't support a feature that hasn't yet been uh, developed. It's kind of a chicken and the egg situation. Um, so once embargoes is done and kind of crystallized, then we can add support to that to the migration utilities and kill two birds with one stone. All right. So when we talk about Islandora 8 as a repository, people want to know, what can you do right now and without much fuss, right? Because um, when you talk to a developer, you know, what can Islandora 8 do as an institutional repository? You can, you can do anything. We can do all these things. But then you have to start talking about timelines and priorities when a lot of people who want to implement Islander 8 as an institutional repository knows say, no, what can I do now without having to throw hours of configuration and development time at this thing? So what can we do right now? Um, as Ryan mentioned, some of these things are provided by Islander 8 just by default as it is already, um, such as persisting content into Fedora 4 slash 5, which was kind of that baseline of what we're trying to do that an institutional repository would like Islandora for is persistence, pr preservation of this content. But we also have things like collections and sub-collections via the member of structure that we have, which also includes breadcrumbs uh, following that structure. And that's also how you can do complex objects at the moment is through this hierarchy structure that we have. We can also pull uh, text out of PDFs for full text searching, which is really nice. Um, we're using a microservices module uh, model. When you put in a PDF, we say, okay, go and use this microservice to pull that text out of the PDF and put it in a field on the object. That way, the search processes can index that. So that's all provided by Islandora 8, because we had to do some custom tooling around to get those features working right. Um, but a lot of this functionality for IRs in Islandora 8 comes from the fact that we are leaning so heavily on Drupal itself now. A lot of the IR solution packs were built because we couldn't use the Drupal modules for it because of the way we had integrated it with Fedora. But now that we've kind of pull those two apart a bit, uh, we can use a lot more of the things that are simply built for Drupal because they were built for Drupal. So I have a smattering of uh, items that are on here and there's plenty more, uh, but you can use the LDAP plugin for institutional logins. Uh, there's also an ORCID login. I know there's some interest in getting some more integration with ORCID, but if you have an ORCID login, you can do that right now. Um, sites that need an OIPMH uh, endpoint, that's available right now. This actually comes from uh, Joe Coral at Kent State, and I'll mention them again in a little bit. Um, but they were coming to implement an Islandora 8 institutional repository. They saw the need, they built it, and they shared it. That's one of the great things about this community, as you were probably all aware, is the community that's 
coming together to build this. We could do site maps and use meta tags for discovery of search engines. Uh, we can do solar-based search and facets for your own search and browse internally. Um, we can use things like Entity Browser for selecting um, agents or uh, organizations or other things that you're looking for on your items. There's things to protect your node from uh, overwrite when you're both editing a node for your workflows. There's the link data lookup field, which allows you to hook into uh, the Library of Congress uh, subject headings to search for those headings and then pull them into your repository on a particular uh, item that you're describing um, and other things. And I can't, again, brief over you, I can't explain everything that they're all doing. But also you can embed uh, your PDF objects in the page using PDFJS. So there's a lot of this and some of it is already included in the default install for Islandora. So there is a lot that we can do right now really quickly uh, without a lot of fuss. As stated, there are some things that still need some work. So now that we've talked about what Islandora 8 can do right now, I think it would be a good time to talk about some interesting IR relevant features that are kind of coming up over the horizon, things that are not quite done yet, but are being actively worked on. Um, one of which is embargoes. Um, in Islandora 7, we had that, that kind of split experience of IP embargoes versus scholar embargoes, and they were managed from two different administration screens, even though they were both embargoes. Since they were implemented in completely different ways, there was really no way to unify that user experience. Um, so we're trying to develop a module that works for Islandora 8 nodes in much the same way that both the IP embargoes and the scholar embargoes worked in seven. Um, unify them into one data structure. So uh, uh, embargo can restrict uh, either globally or be restricted by IP and bounce to a separate page if you're accessing it from off that IP range, just like IP embargoes did in seven. Um, it's got support for um, embargoing things perpetually or having it automatically expire, just like in seven. And it's got support for either embargoing the parent node or the files that are attached to a node. Um, this is um, kind of like how objects and data streams worked in Islandora 7. Um, and one of the most interesting things about uh, the embargoes module, I think, is that um, due to some feedback in the community from people that are more experienced with the internals uh, with Drupal 8, we found out that there's a, a way that you can use Drupal 8's architecture to do plugins that allow you to, if you write something as a plugin, then suddenly you can extend things uh, to make them do what they what they couldn't do before with submodules. So uh, instead of having embargoes do a static amount of types of restrictions and types of overrides, uh, we're going to re-implement those as plugins so that if embargoes doesn't currently do what you want it to do or you need to be able to override it in a new way or apply some new type of restriction, instead of having to fork embargoes or write a completely new embargoes module, you could just write a module that provides a new plugin and then bam, suddenly the core embargoes module handles this and it handles it for everyone else too and it can be shared. Uh, I think that's a really interesting idea that's going to change how we look at embargoes, not only in the Islandora community, but in the open source digital uh, institutional repository community as a whole. It's a really interesting idea. Um, there's also a module that Mark Jordan is working on called, with, with help from some others, uh, the Persistent Identifiers module, which provides a generic framework for minting and registering any kind of persistent identifier. Um, such as DOIs, handles, ARCs, easy IDs, etc. And it actually does this through that plugin architecture that I mentioned earlier. Um, persistent identifiers, like I said, is that generic framework. And then you can come up with individual plugins to support new types of PIDs or new vendors for PIDs. 
Um, it currently supports handles and data site DOIs. Um, if you are wanting to build an Islandora 8 IR in Canada, uh, data site DOI, DOIs seem to be the main thing that everybody uses up there. Uh, here in the States, we use uh, Crossref DOIs a lot, and support for that is in progress. Uh, FSU, for instance, really wants to use Crossref DOI minting, um, and we're working on making that a possibility right now. Um, in addition to persistent identifiers, you could also use um, this module to mint local uh, unique identifiers, or maybe even uh, pearls, persistent URLs that you might want to use for your local IR. Um, last but not least, we have uh, dynamic citations display, which was a very popular feature of Islandora 7 given to us by Scholar. And it's kind of weird to mention this because we have lots of ideas but no code, but it is, that's because we're, we're currently trying to hammer out exactly how that should work, but it is not a technical problem necessarily because we, we understand how SitePROC works on the back end. It works very similar to the way that it did for Islandora 7. So we just need to make that uh, a reality with a little bit of theming. So you might be saying, hey, yeah, this all sounds great in theory, but can I actually do this now? Um, and yes, you can. And there's a few different things to look at uh, to make that case. One of which is this excellent resource. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because you're going to hear about it from uh, Rosie in about an hour, if I got my time right there, um, about the research lifecycle approaching approach using Islandora. This comes from our friends at the University of Prince Edward Island, uh, their uh, research data management project. Um, they currently have a site that talks about their work, but they've done a lot of this development work around putting research data into an Islandora 8 repository. Now, I don't know where you fall on the, are data repositories the same as IRs, but you have to admit that even the Venn diagrams overlap significantly. And so a lot of what they talk about here can directly apply to your own repository. And they've done a lot of work They've done a lot of contributions that are already went into the existing Islandora 8 as it stands right now, but also some work that's in the process of being pulled in as well. So they've done a lot of thinking in this space. They've done a lot of work in this space and they've shared their findings and they're trying to educate uh, sites about how they can do this work. So this is a good resource if you're looking to get into this space of doing institutional repositories in Islandora 8, even beyond uh, research data management as well. But again, this is not a site that's a IR live in the wild, but we still do have one of those. Oops, wrong direction. Uh, Kent State has a working institutional repository in Islandora 8 online right now. You can go and visit it right now. Um, they already have a lot of content in there. They have over 3,000 articles, several journals, images, and conference proceedings all represented in here. They have videos in there. And like I mentioned, um, Joe Coral at Kent State was the one that gave us the OIPMH module to begin with. Uh, now, they do admit that they've done a lot of local custom development, so you can't get this up and running exactly like they have it without some work, right? Because they did have some local development time trying to nudge them in the direction of, hey, let's bring more of this out to the community. But they've already contribute, contributed a great deal and they are evidence that you can do this now, really. And they've done some great work. One of the interesting features uh, that they've done with this is they've integrated with the open journal system. So if you have an open journal system that you want to get connected, uh, they would be a good resource to talk to about how to get those things connected because uh, they've already done it. So yes, it can be done. Um, people are doing it and we can accomplish a great deal in this space already. And um, we hope that through the rest of this day, we'll have further evidence of 
our capability of doing it and a good idea of how to make it even better moving forward. And of course, you can get involved. So how can you get involved? Of course, there are the weekly uh, Islandora 8 tech calls, which are more general, it's not IR specific, but it's a great place to learn about what's going on in Islandora 8 right now. Um, you can, of course, come with your issues and questions and ideas, whether they're related to IRs or not or anything, come and ask and you'll have a whole bunch of developers sitting there willing to talk to you about what you're trying to work on. You can also, of course, come to the Islandora IR interest group calls, of which Brian mentioned he is a co-convener uh, the last Thursdays at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. So this is specific to IR content, um, but there's a lot of overlap with IRs and other things. So another good place to ask questions. You can, of course, come to the Islandora Slack channel, which uh, I frequent quite a bit. I know Brian's on there quite a bit as well. And even if we're not online right then, we will come back eventually and see your questions that you've already posted there. And, follow up with you later. So it's a great place to have a conversation and get involved and have multiple eyes look at uh, what you need. And sometimes right away. So that stated, do you guys have any questions for us? We'll just give a minute or two for folks to type into the chat if they need to. And I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see the Zoom interface a bit better for questions. No questions. I guess that means that we did a, a really great job explaining everything. <laughs> Here we go. We have a couple of them. So the first question is, does anyone have an IR in beta? So we do have the Kent State one that's in production and we don't usually hear about beta projects all that often, um, but we are going to hear from Discovery Garden shortly about their getting uh, a first release of Discovery Garden Island or 8 IR. So maybe they have some more ideas about who's in beta uh, with this. But if anyone else wants to post that they are working on one, we'd love to hear about it. I think um, maybe, I know that Simon Fraser University is working on an IR, IR project and they have a presentation later today. I don't know if they would describe their status as beta or not. Is there anyone from Simon Fraser who maybe wants to give a brief overview? Ah, okay. Emily asked how much of the custom work that Kent State has done will be contributed back to the community. That's really a question for Kent State, um, who I wish they were here to share all of their great work with us in the presentation. Um, I would have really liked to have seen that. Uh, but Joe is somewhat active on Slack, if you want to catch him there to talk about his work there. He's been really great, uh, with me at least, uh, chatting about what they've done and what's local and what's not. Um, but yeah, I, I would have to defer that to Joe. Looks like we have a question about how difficult or easy is it to integrate the alt metrics donut, um, that classic circular display that um, shows how much you're being discussed on Twitter or in blogs or things like that. Um, if we're talking about the same thing, uh, I think the answer to that is incredibly easy, like trivially easy. Um, I set up the alt metrics donut in an Island or a seven IR and all it really required was, I think it was like an image tag where you included the DOI as one of the data attributes and th they had an API that automatically looked up all the information and then returned it as an image. Um, so I think if we're talking about Islandora 7, um, there's already an Islandora badges module that does this for you. And if we're talking Islandora 8, then all it would require is getting the data out of whatever field you stored the DOI in and formatting it into an image tag, um, which could probably be done in a block in like five minutes. So 
Um, if that's if that's a use case for you, I'd like to hear more about that because that's low hanging fruit for sure. See, Bethany Seeger has specific question. We need to limit access to high res files, but are not looking at embargoes yet. Can the embargo module help with that? Um, currently, the two modes that embargoes runs in is embargo the node and all the files or embargo just the files. Um, but one of the extensions that I want to add to it is instead of embargo all the files, just embargo a specific file. Um, so the answer is not yet, but hopefully soon it will be able to help with that. You should be able to select which file you want to embargo. I'll also mention that the permissions by entity module allows you to restrict access to particular um, media and their files based off of a term that you define and, and you can attach that term to a role. So you can also do that right now without embargoes as well, which is what we're doing. Is anyone migrating to Islandora 8 as an IR from a different IR platform? Uh, for instance, not Islandora 7. Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Danny or Melissa, are you aware of anyone coming to I, I8 fresh? Uh, I mean, we keep going back to them, but I, I, I can't state it's not coming from Islandora 7. Uh, I can't recall exactly what they were coming from, but... Uh, they were coming from B-Press, B-press. and that's also when uh, UNLV eventually goes to an IR, uh, will also be coming from B-Press. And I see some responses in the chat. Uh, Johns Hopkins is coming from DSpace, uh, Arizona State University is migrating from a custom Django repository. And uh, Pittsburgh is considering a migration from ePrints. So unless I missed them in the upscroll, I think that's all the questions that have been asked thus far. Does that sound correct to you, Melissa? Uh, there is one. Uh, we have publications that consist of multiple PDFs, sometimes because of different embargoes and sometimes because of multiple versions. Is the idea to use the compound module to bundle those? And can you embargo some of those PDFs? Yeah, it depends on your data structure there, whether you're having like one node that has lots of PDF media attached, or if you're going to do it more like Islandora 7 did, where you have uh, one node that is the compound parent, and then a bunch of child nodes that represent each individual version, and then each one of those has um, uh, a PDF media attached. I would be more partial to doing it the second way, but I'm not sure what the best practice is for that kind of thing right now in Islandora 8. Um, and yes, if you did it the second way, then you could put a file level embargo on each of those. Um, but if you did a whole bunch of different media entities on the same node, um, then as I said earlier, there's not currently a way to only embargo some of them. Currently it's all the files or none of the files, but being able to do only some of the files is definitely uh, a feature to be implemented um, that we know that people want. Um, Seth, do you have any input on uh, the various, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The virtues of using one node with lots of media entities or one parent compound that has lots of subnodes. Yeah, so I think the original data model that um, Islandora was working from was that you would really have one node per one master media and then the other medias would all be derivatives. But as Rosie points out in the comments, there's the multi-file media uh, work that's been done really pushed by UPEI. Um, that allows a stronger, uh, a shifting of that model to where you have one node and multiple media that are all like their own master and derivatives all bundled together in a single media entity. Um, but as you mentioned, the embargo, the embargo model as it currently stands would favor the one node per one master media 
model. Whereas if we got the embargo to work better with pinpointing specific media, uh, you could use the multi-file uh, media uh, structure that's currently in pull request form right now that they've developed, which I think there's a lot of interest in going that direction for those things. Uh, but again, I'll also mention that permissions by term, which is a separate thing provided by the Drupal community, could allow you to say, hey, only this multi-file media package should be restricted, whereas others can be opened up. There's a question. Do you think the Drupal Autopath is good enough for use with custom IDs if you only want local ones? Persistent IDs and local, that is. I think a lot of people are going that way. Um, that, that, that's the advice that you will frequently hear from pretty much all of us is, yeah, make a field that you want to use and then use Path Auto to slap that on as your uh, URI, your alias. And then one of the nice things is I've been told that you can have multiple of those, uh, which is nice as well. Um, but that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, actually, uh, at UNLV, we're not quite doing that. We have a configuration to wholesale copy our identifier into our path field uh, rather than using path auto. But I know a lot of people are using path auto for that uh, feature. And additional information about Path Auto, if you're going to be using um, Path Auto in uh, a mixed mode Islandora 8 setup where you have um, digital collections like archival and special collection stuff kind of in the same bucket as IR stuff. Um, we've been told by Google Scholar that um, this, this is a nice to have and not a requirement, but it definitely helps Google Scholar figure out what stuff is scholarly and what stuff isn't. If those, if the scholarly stuff has a common um, slug, like, you know, your institution's URL slash IR slash and then the object ID, then you could tell um, Google Scholar that everything under my institution's URL slash IR is IR content that you should be indexing. Um, of course, it doesn't have to be slash IR. It can be whatever you want it to be. But as long as that URL slug is different than the special collections and archival stuff, um, that that's one way that a Google Scholar can figure out what's what. And apparently, it gives you quite a boost because Google Scholar likes to be confident about what it's indexing. So the more you can help it be explicit about what it's indexing, the more it appreciates it and will put your IR's content uh, higher up in terms of page rank. Uh, so one more, one more call for um, if, if you have any questions that you wanted to answer but you didn't feel comfortable or you have a question later that you didn't think of. Um, that slide that talked about the Island or a tech calls, um, the IR interest group, and especially the Slack, um, all great ways to get in touch with people. And one of the greatest things about the Island or community is how super friendly and helpful everybody is. So don't be afraid to ask a question.